Sheridan Hills family. This is Pastor Ben here in North Carolina. As you can see behind me, there's a bunch of mountains and we're um, looking at God's justice. It's a really important attribute and as we've considered several of, other, of God's other attributes in these last couple weeks, we're, we're now at God's justice and I wanna open up God's word with you. Before we do, let's go ahead and pray and ask God for help. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us, and pray that we would look at your word today and learn that we would be just, just like you are just, for your glory in Jesus' name, amen. So I want to open up God's word with you all. In these last several months, we've seen uh, news about justice and what the culture thinks about justice. We've seen social media and what social media, folks on social media think about social, show, social justice, and we've also seen a lot of our family, our friends, um, have conversations about this, maybe your coworkers. And we need to get a biblical perspective on God's justice, because ultimately that's what matters. There's not multiple flavors of justice. There's just one form of justice, and that's God's justice. So we need to look at God's word. The first place we're gonna be looking at is Deuteronomy 10, verse 18 and 19. And with each of these passages that we're going to look at, we're going to look at four, we're going to ask a question and then answer it so that we can see what's, what's the next best way to um, live in a just and righteous way. So the first passage is Deuteronomy 10, verse 18 to 19, and we're going to ask the question, how does God act in this passage? In verse 18, Moses says, Yahweh executes justice for the fatherless and the widow, and loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing. Love the sojourner, therefore, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. Here Moses is reminding the Israelites that God spared them from Egypt, and he showed his justice to the Egyptians, and he showed mercy toward the Israelites. Therefore, we should act in the same way. We should execute justice in a similar way. And so we can come with, come away with a statement that God's actions are right and just in every way. Everything that God does is just and right. Let's look at another passage in Deuteronomy 32, verse 1 to 4, and we want to ask the question, why does God act justly? What is it about God that makes him act right and just? This is what Moses says here. This is a song, and it's toward the end of Moses' life, and he listen to what he says. It's, it's key. Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak, and let the earth hear the words of my mouth. And then in verse 3, For I will proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God. Now, what does Moses say is part of God's name? Look at verse 4. The rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice, a God of faithfulness and without iniquity. Just and upright is he. And there you go. What's in God's name? It's his justice. That's the first thing that... Moses wants us to see about God's character, about his name. And we can say very simply that God's actions are right and just in every way because, as Moses says here, he is right and just in his very being, in the core of his character. So that takes us then to a third question that you might have. What is the most important way God shows his justice? If you think about biblical history, did God show his justice when he brought the Israelites out of Egypt? Did God show his justice when he made King David the king of Israel? When exactly was the most crucial moment in Israel's history or in Bible history where God demonstrates his justice? Where is this seen most vividly? Well, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 3 where God's righteousness and his justice are seen evidently. Romans chapter 3, verse 21 to 26. Now the righteousness of God has been manifested. It has been shown, it has been demonstrated apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. Verse 22, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So literally, the justice of God is manifest in the person of Jesus Christ. And then in verse 25, Paul continues, 
God put Jesus forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This act, this act of sacrificing Jesus was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. So in the past, in the Old Testament, how did people get saved? Well, there wasn't a plan A and a plan B. Jesus Christ was in the plan B. Jesus was, was always plan A. And we see here that God's divine forbearance, his patience, his kindness, passed over those sins in the past, the sins of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all the forefathers, all of church history, passed over them and ultimately culminated in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And that's finally, at that moment, that key moment in history where God shows his righteousness, his justice in making Jesus the propitiation by his blood. He is the ultimate sacrifice for sin. So saints in the Old Testament, saints before the sacrifice of Christ, saints during the time of Christ, saints after Christ's death and resurrection, and saints today are saved through one plan, the only plan of God for salvation through Jesus Christ, death on the cross. Look at what verse 26 says. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So we have a past, present, and also future, the one who will have faith in Jesus Christ. So we can have add to our statement now that God's actions are just and right in every way because he is right and just. And the most important way God demonstrates his justice is through Jesus' death on our behalf. Now, this leads us to a fourth passage, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. And we're going to ask the question, how does Jesus' sacrifice prove that God is just? So how does it prove that God is just? Listen to 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. For our sake, God made Jesus to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Jesus we might become the righteousness of God. So how does Jesus' sacrifice demonstrate that God is just? Here's how. God's justice is served when Jesus gets what we deserve on the cross. In other words, Jesus on the cross experienced the full fledge of God's wrath. And he was separated in a very mysterious way from, from God at that moment. And at that moment, God pouring all of his wrath against all the sin, right? Paul says that God made Jesus to be sin. We don't know what that means exactly. Scholars debate that. But ultimately it means that Jesus Christ on the cross experienced the wrath of God who was unleashing all of his wrath on Jesus because of the sin of humanity. So listen to this again. God's Justice is served when Jesus gets what we deserve, and God's mercy is served when we get what Jesus deserves. So it's not, it's not justice that God saves us. It's justice that God unleashes his wrath on Jesus on the cross. What we get in exchange for that justice is mercy. We experience God's mercy by Jesus taking our place. So let me say that again. God's justice is served when Jesus gets what we deserve because Jesus represents all of humanity's sin on the cross. But God's mercy is served when we get what Jesus deserves. And what does Jesus deserve? He is an upright, righteous man, never sinned. So God counts us righteous through Jesus' death. It's like we have never sinned. God sees, when he looks at us, he sees Jesus. In other words, we will inherit the kingdom because of Jesus' sacrifice. That's mercy. And we often confuse justice and mercy. But think about it this way. We often ask the question, why is it fair for God to send innocent people to hell? Well, first of all, there are no innocent people. Paul told us in Romans 3, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory. Second of all, God's mercy means that he is not showing us his justice. It means that he is not at that moment showing his justice. In other words, our salvation is only based 
on the justice of God when it comes to Jesus' sacrifice. But our salvation is completely because of God's mercy. Did he act unjustly? No. He acted justly because he punished sin, but he let us go because of his mercy. Just think about that for a second. The, the question shouldn't be, why does God allow innocent people to go to hell? Because there are no innocent people. The question is, why does God allow anybody to go to heaven? And friends, if, if you've thought about that at all, you, you know deep down that our sin, because it has separated us from God, we all deserve to go to hell. So anything that happens in this world, any injustice we face, pales into comparison with what we actually deserve, which is God's full wrath. So let's close with this. We've answered, we've answered the question, we, we've answered these four questions, and I, I want to close with some application. The first thing we need to see here is that in order for us to be just and to be righteous in society and as individuals, is we need to get right with God. Many of the problems we see in our culture today are because people are not right with God. People don't love God, and people are not living in, according to His righteous standard. They've not been transformed, so the Holy Spirit is not working in them, and it's not, it's not going to work for us to live a righteous life apart from God. Everybody has their own standard of righteousness, but the one that matters most is, and is the ultimate standard is God's standard. And so we need to get right with God. Maybe you need to repent. Maybe you're thinking, man, I, I have just been living an unrighteous life. I've, I've done things that have been unjust at work or in my marriage or with my children or with my family, my friends. Now's the time to repent, to get right with God, to believe that Jesus Christ died in your place so that you would experience God's mercy. But the second thing we want to see here is not just that vertical relationship, but a horizontal relationship that we have with others. We want to see that to come to a point of, of living just and righteous in our society means that we have to get right with each other, with others, through Jesus Christ. So all this talk about racial reconciliation, all this talk about um, protecting the unborn, all of this talk about caring for the needs of others and, and caring for social reform and poverty and, and all these political things that we've been hearing those things will not matter ultimately unless we get right with each other through Jesus Christ. And so I encourage you and I challenge you to think about your own relationship with Jesus Christ and how that affects relationships with others. But thirdly, we need to trust that everything that has happened up until this point in your life and what will happen from now on into the future until we go home to be with the Lord, all the things that have happened in our life Every time God does something in our lives, He has acted right and just. God has never made a mistake in your life, in my life, in anybody's life. So things may have happened. Somebody may have treated you unjustly at one point in your life. Somebody may be treating you unjustly right now in your life. Listen to this. God tells us, do not avenge yourselves. Let me avenge you. It's a good thing that God is righteous and just. You know why? Because all of those injustices that have been committed against you will not go unpunished. God will avenge us at the end. He promises to do that. So listen, if you have experienced injustice in your life, give it to God. Trust Him. Let Him avenge you. Let Him be the God who avenges all of our injustices. Now if you're on the flip side of that, if you are the one who's committed in injustices, again, repent. God will avenge those who you've committed injustices against. So I encourage you to trust God in this matter, that he will do what is right and what is just every single time. And finally, friends, I encourage you to just reject completely the cultural and societal standards of justice. There are multiple flavors of justice. There's just one true form of justice, and that's God's justice. And if we do that, if you turn off Fox, if you turn off CNN, if you turn off... If you stop reading the Washington Post and the New York Times and stop looking at Facebook and Twitter and stop thinking about what all these different political pundits say, I, I assure you, if you open up God's Word and look at His view of justice, look at His character, I assure you that we 
Sheridan Hills can live righteous and just lives in our society and our culture and we can bring glory to God in that way so let's go ahead and pray let me let me uh, pray for us and let's go and live righteous and just lives for God's glory father thank you that you are a just and right righteous God that everything you do is just and righteous and that ultimately in Christ you demonstrate your full-fledged justice by punishing sin in Christ's sacrifice but by also showing us your mercy Lord, fuel us this week. Give us energy. Give us strength to live just and righteous lives. Help us to repent. Help us to love you. Help us to love others. And help us to trust that you are good and that you act righteously and justly every single day. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all and have a wonderful week.